think it's okay to get an antler shed, grind down the points and let them have it as a toy. A friend of mine said that that will teach them in the woods, if they see a shed, it'll be like a toy, so they'll pick it up. You have true toys um, and toys in general. I am against them. Habit forming goes both ways, good and bad. Chew toys promote chewing. And, and people talk about the idea of, well, it gives them something to chew on. Yeah, it does. And it also creates a habit. So we're not going to give them things that look like antlers, feel like antlers, are antlers, when our goal is for a shed dog to pick up an antler and bring it back to me. And you've got those antlers laying around the house or the yard or the kennel or the crate or wherever you're keeping them. And they chew on them for 10 minutes out of a 24 hour day. What do they do the other 23 hours and 50 minutes of the day? Ignore, walk by, not pick up, not. All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, this is Dog Bone Podcast number 50. That's the golden anniversary for some, and for us, it's the same, I suppose, huh? Golden anniversary, fi number 50. It's a big milestone, really. Um, and, and I say that jokingly, but I also say it kind of serious because when we started doing the podcast, Ben and I talked about we thought it was a good... Um, when did we start them? A year, a year ago now? It's over a year. I, we, we started them, and then we stopped. Well, we started them with Steph. Because yeah. we started them out. Steph was with me on to start them out. Um, and I really enjoyed that. I think she enjoyed it, but it was, it was hard to coordinate and schedule and we have a hard time getting together to have dinner, much less, uh, record podcast. And I say that kind of jokingly as well, but maybe not so much. I mean, busy schedules running, you know, we all run into busy schedules. And so, um, it, it was, uh, the podcast was something that we started because we really felt like we wanted to have another way of, um, providing and sharing content. And, but it became tough to get coordinated to do. And so we kind of took a break with them. And I don't know, we probably did maybe a less than 10, I would say, to start out with. And then we kind of re, re, we, for several weeks, we didn't do them, maybe even months, I would have to look back. But um, what got us back into doing them was messages from, from you guys that are listening that said, you know, I really enjoyed these. Are you going to keep doing them? You know, qu almost questioning whether or not, uh, the future of them was going to be, uh, continued. And so that was when Ben, um, and I talked about it and we said, we should do them. We just got to do them a little looser. Um, we, we, and if you listen to these, uh, you realize how loose they really are. Our intentions are not to make them fancy um, or real, real high production. We do record them a little bit. Um, ben just puts the camera on a tripod and we use them to do promos basically for that. But uh, we also have talked about maybe at some point turning these into video um, pieces as well. And we might migrate that to our YouTube channel. But uh, the significance of 50 is I feel like our we have recommitted basically and I and I say it because the reason we did was because of you guys listening and the amount of support we've gotten so I want to thank you I start usually I thank you guys at the end I'm gonna probably do it again uh, I'm gonna thank you in the beginning of this one because without it we wouldn't probably be doing them um, to to that point we're going to continue with a trend that we've done the last few um, questions generated from social media uh, Facebook Instagram our our real solid ways to get a hold of me. Um, I do answer them. It just, sometimes it takes me a little bit, just depends on volume, probably get, I don't know, on Facebook, maybe 10 a day, um, on Instagram, probably not as many, although the trend is shifting a little bit more to Instagram. Um, as far as interaction and traction, we got into the whole social media thing. I would say a little bit later, uh, than I wish we would have, but, um, what we really do is we really try to connect with you guys through it. So um, we're going to use Facebook uh, today um, to generate topics for discussion. Today we're going to talk a little bit because it's um, on the time of year. Uh, I have definitely seen a trend in the last two to three weeks shift as far as questions and comments and just thought processes within the outdoor community as hunting seasons slow down and, and end uh, deer seasons end shed hunting is the next logical season um, for a lot of people including myself um, ben and i just got done um, pretty much wrapped up our season hunting wise um, and one of the things that is on on our mind is what deer made it 
Uh, shed hunting is gonna be a great way for us to confirm things. Trail cameras is another. We use, um, we're really heavily leaning on another product line of ours, it's Hodeg. Um, it's the Hodeg Licking Stick, which is the specific product, but the brand is Hodeg. We've got um, a product line there that helps us with our trail cameras. So we have been um, monitoring those. We're gonna continue to. Those are ways for us to effectively know when our deer shed antlers or, and not. I've got deer around my house here all of a sudden. It went from um, a desert where we had very few deer that I would see um, particularly during daylight hours, but even at nighttime on trail cameras, it was really slow here. We don't have that much property, but we do plant a lot of beans and those beans now become a major food source as soon as there's snow and cold. And so I'm seeing 10, 15, 20 deer a night now, uh, eating our beans. That'll be for a limited period of time because they will eat them out. Uh, we don't have, we've got a couple acres and that'll, that won't last long, but Shed season is the next thing in my mind. And one of the things that we use our cameras and our, our licking sticks for is to gauge when and how early, if there's a particular deer. There was one deer a few years back that was big. Um, it was He was behind our house. He was eating behind our house. We get trail cam pictures of him, um, quite a few of them. We also, he'd come in our backyard and eat. Uh, as soon as the beans got eaten far away, they would slowly work their way closer to the house. We literally plant soybeans basically right up to our backyard. and Towards the end of the, later, later, later on in the year, the deer would just feed closer and closer to the house. Well, we would watch this deer. He was in the, uh, our backyard light. Um, really nice buck. And we ended up finding both sides of his antlers. Well, we knew, and, and these deer, that was a year that there was a lot of snow um, and a lot of cold. And these deer will not burn a lot of calories if they don't have to. So deer are smart. That's how they survive. And so it's a, it's a, it's a real simple math equation, eat more calories than you burn. And so they don't wander around aimlessly. Uh, they're going to take the path of least resistance. So as soon as a deer trail is established, they all follow it. Um, for a shed hunter, deep snow makes things a lot easier, um, throughout the winter because what it does is it eliminates my need to shed hunt most of the woods. Um, as long as you pay attention to where those trails are, uh, that's where you got to look between bedding and food and on, and on the trails because there's no other tracks typically in anywhere outside of that. So this um, deer that we were, wanted the sheds off of really bad was on trails, coming to feed and going back to bed. And we, we made sure that we did not even think about looking for them until we knew he had shed both of both sides. And we found out based on one night he came in and he was shed. Um, and within 24 hours, we'd found both sides because he didn't go more than a couple hundred yards from our backyard. So that was a, a technique and, and I'm big on that. I, we, we are Buffalo County, the farm we hunt over there, acres and acres and acres of beans um, we plant and we leave for the deer and we find a lot of sheds in the spring within 40 acres of those bean fields and it's because those deer just don't want to there's no reason for them to do anything else get up go eat go back lay down get up go eat go lay down so uh that's just like shed hunting um idea that i think you're you really struggle when you bump deer around and push deer around and as soon as you got smaller properties if you push them off your property they're they're really susceptible to pressure right now they're not going to take pressure they've been hunted for the last three months and so the littlest bit of pressure they're going to go let's go away from that and so as the seasons end and we all get excited um, about shed season, the people that stay out of their woods, which is a lot of people don't go in the woods now because it's snow is deep and there's really no reason to be in there if you're not hunting, the, that's where the deer will live. And so that's where they spend the majority of the time. That's where the highest percentage or, or chance of them shedding out is going to be. So keep that in mind, I think, um, as you get prepped for shed season and get excited about it. You, the best shed dog in the world won't find sheds if they're not there. And so I, I tell people that a lot because the best duck dogs retrieve a lot of ducks. I mean, they just, they always do. And part of the reason is, is because they're good duck dogs, they're trained. But the real reason is, is because they're put in a position that they have an opportunity to retrieve a lot of ducks. And good duck dogs typically 
the owners get invited to duck clubs, good duck clubs. Well, those are in, in good spots. You get you get asked to go to the good hunting spots when you've got a good, well-behaved dog. If you don't, you don't get invited to the good spots. So the ones that are good get the most opportunities because the ones that are good have the opportunity to go to the places that are good, if that makes sense. Shed hunting is the same way. The best shed dogs find sheds because sheds are there. You can have a dog that's trained really well, but if you take them where there are no antlers, you're not finding any. So you got to keep that in mind. A lot of people struggle with the idea of we never find sheds on our land. And I go, well, are there any sheds there to be found? Oh yeah, there's big, you know, we got a lot of big deer. And I'll ask them to show me and they show me pictures from November. Trust me, man, we all get good pictures in November. It's who has pictures in January, February, and March. That's the person that I want to um, go shed hunting with because that's the one you're going to find antlers from. So keep that in mind. Now, we're talking a little bit of shed hunting um, because this question uh, comes from a guy this week. Um, let's see. He sent me a message. Uh, and we'll, we'll actually spin off of the shed question because I'm going to start right in the very beginning with him. Uh, this is literally, I got this on Monday, so it's a fresh question. Guy got a, a dog that was an English lab mixed with a Catahoula. Um, he's going to have it be a shed hunting companion. He'd like to track with it. Um, he's got lots of questions on raising the puppy. Um, he's done some reading up on the two breeds. He's seen some videos of ours. Um, either way, his questions, he said, are mostly about training techniques, not necessarily for sheds or tracking, but all around house training. Um, and I think my answer back to him was, look, that's where it all starts is the foundation. You guys have all heard me talk about that. It's a broken record. I'll continue to talk about it. Uh, I spend 10 to 12 months focused on that first and foremost. Um, Bella, who is uh, gonna be 10 months pretty quick. Uh, I think she's about 10 months right now, actually. Um, I think she turned just a couple days ago. Eh, she might've just turned nine months. I'd have to look again. But she's nine to 10 months, somewhere in that window. Uh, very, very little formal hunting that we've done. Although this week, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, this week we started her uh, uh, picking up the antler, picking up the shed antler training dummy, uh, conditioning to the shape. We did it um, for multiple reasons. I think she was about ready to get there. Uh, also because we're filming some stuff for North American Whitetail. One of our developing your deer dog segments this year is going to be uh, specifically we're documenting Bella. Um, which Bella's getting a lot of run. Like she's getting a lot of exposure. Uh, she is, we've got an article, uh, a column in Gun Dog Magazine with her. We've got Bella Be Good, the series on our YouTube channel. We're doing a Bella Be Good series through Gun Dog or through North American Whitetail. So for, for filming that, we had to film some stuff for our shed training segment. So that was part of the reason that we did it. Um, and so, but we started, literally just started in on some of that stuff. Leading up to this point, it's been all foundational stuff that transfers to the field, is necessary in the field to do the hunting stuff. So this guy's question said, you know, I'm an, I'm, I've got a lot of questions on just foundational training, basically. Well, I think that's where it starts, and I put a lot of effort into hopefully um, relaying that information. So uh, between our foundation DVD, our puppy DVD, that's the stuff this guy needs right now. So I actually made a mention in here to, them, to him, I said, you know, our DVD series is laid out in sequence, puppy first, foundation second, shed and game recovery follows. And that's, that's logical and makes sense. And I, I recommend everybody look at it that way. I also think that our podcast, our YouTube channel, our Facebook and our Instagram are great supplemental um, tools that support those DVDs. The DVDs are sequenced and recorded logically, um, but they also... And so they give you a roadmap, but all these other, there's so many other variables that come up with training dogs and there's so many differences between dogs, different dogs. So I think all these other tools that we're, we're using to try to pass on information are the things that you absorb after you've got a general idea. If you jump in, I think if someone jumps into like a podcast and just listens to our podcast or just watches a series on YouTube or just watches one of our Facebook series that we've done in the past, I think... It's probably gonna help you, but I also think it may be confusing because it's gonna have a lot of things that may or may not apply to you and you have to sort through it. You have to, you don't have like this general idea or concept of the big picture 
of our goals with training and how we get the get to each one of those goals because they're all linked together. So I think the DVDs give you that. And then from that, you get way more detail information that you can kind of sift through. Um, I, I recommend listening to as much of it as you can and picking and choosing what fits with you. I also recommend you listen to other people. I think you should watch as much information as you can from other trainers, other videos, other articles, and then you pick and choose what works best for you. That's what I do. So, uh, so this guy's second question, so, so his first question came, um, that was a message to me and I gave him that answer. So then he came back and he said, hey, I'm crate training today. And he's barking and whining since I put him in there about a half hour ago. I'm assuming that's part of the process or should I use a large blanket to cover the whole crate or should I partially uncover it? Question mark. So as I scroll back, I see this puppy is literally uh, like seven weeks old, eight weeks old. So he brought the dog back home that message was on a Monday, this is on a Tuesday. So he literally just got the puppy. Um, he put the puppy in, I bet you this is probably his first time crate training, and the dog is screaming its lungs out uh, for a half hour. And I, I replied back to him, I said, man, get by, invest in a nice little pair of earplugs, because for the first week, it's gonna be like that. And maybe longer, maybe shorter, but probably longer. So the half hour is nothing. Um, yes, you got to let them cry through that. You got to let them whine through that. You can't reward the whining and fussing with, oh, I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to let them out because all that does is fuel fire, fuel that fire to get out of that kennel. So uh, I answered back to him. I said, man, you got to wait them out. Uh, leave them alone until you get a change. He'll eventually actually tire himself out. These dogs wear themselves out whining and fussing, and then they take a nap, and then you wake them up and reward them for being quiet and taking naps, and they go, hmm, it's not so bad in here. It's actually kind of safe and comfortable and if I'm quiet I got a chance of getting out so there's a little bonus crate training stuff for you now his next question is and then he answered back and he, so I messaged him back that answer and then he said yeah oddly enough about five minutes after messaging you messaged me he got quiet I said that's not odd at all so that's the way it goes so that was a, a positive little thing that he got from me um, crate training wise now his next question so he says, do you think it's okay to get an antler shed, grind down the points, and let him have it as a toy in and out of his kennel? A friend of mine said that that will teach him in the woods that if they see a shed, it'll be like a toy, so they'll pick it up. I definitely do not agree with your friend. Um, here's, here's why. And this is, so this is, this is a bit of a shed question, but it's also a bit can borderline on the idea of true toys um, and toys in general. I am against them. I think they're training tools. And so typically I, I'm for training tools because I, I support the idea of training and forming habits. And I think that's all training is, is forming habit. Here's the thing about it. You have to realize that habit forming goes both ways, good and bad. And so you are going to train, you're gonna use that as a training tool and the training tool will form a habit and the habit will be a few things. If you give your dogs antlers as toys, I don't care if you if, if you grind the if you grind the points down. I, I think the point of that is oh, so then they won't poke themselves, hurt themselves, jab themselves. I love the idea of it. I think the technique is poor, because if you've ever ground down an antler, um, if you haven't, grab a ball of hair and light it on fire and take a big whiff, because that's what it's going to smell like. It smells like burning hair. It stinks. Um, doesn't smell like an antler, definitely, and it's actually a little bit repulsive. So, now does it bother a dog? I don't know if it bothers him or not. It bugs me maybe more. But it doesn't do you any value there, and, and it, it, there's, there's nothing connected to it positively. The, besides maybe the fact that you're giving them something that they're not going to hurt themselves with, that, I guess you could look at it that way. Um, but here's, here's my thought with it. If you give them something to chew on, and that could be this antler, or it could be a squeaky toy that looks like a little duck that's got a squeaker in it, or it could be, I don't care, name whatever it is, the habit is gonna be formed, chewing. And so chew toys promote chewing. And, and people talk about the idea of, well, it gives them something to chew on. Yeah, it does, and it also creates a habit. If, if fing chewing fingernails is a habit, if you make it so that your kids can't get at their fingernails to chew on them, they won't. I have a bad habit. I chew my fingernails at times. It's a bad habit. 
If I didn't have fingernails, I won't chew on fingernails and I won't form the habit. If you don't have chew toys, your dog is not likely to form a habit of chewing. Will they have desire to chew when they're teething? I don't know if they have desire to chew. I think they have desire to relieve pain. My ba- We have a baby, Lillian, right now. She's 10 months old. She, almost 11 months old, she's teething right now. She drools like, uh, like you've never seen. She just drools constantly. It, she's crying. It hurts. She's putting her mouth in her hand. She puts her fingers in her mouth. You give her something to chew on, she's going to chew on it because it hurts. I think it's trying to... She's trying to figure out how to relieve some of that stress. So what do we do? We give them a little bit of a frozen little chew ring thing and it helps numb it up. And I guess it's going to help her out with getting through that. I do think when puppies teeth, they're stressed out a little bit. I think it's sore. I think it hurts a little bit. I think their gums get sore. That's a time where I'd give them an ice cube. Give them an ice cube. It's a little reward. It's a little bit of a treat. Even my older dog, it develops a, a treat into a treat. Even my older dogs, I'll give ice cubes to today occasionally, not all the time, but when the, when the freezer opens up and, you, and I'm making a cocktail, my dogs come to full attention because they go, ooh, may have a treat coming here. Sometimes they get one, sometimes they don't, but it's because it's been formed when they were puppies and they were teething. Teething is not going to happen when they're 8, 10, 12 weeks old. Teething is 4 to 6 months. And, so, and it happens over a week to 10 days, usually maybe up to 2 weeks between when you lose the first one and when you lose the last one usually happens pretty quickly. So that window of time establishes and kind of forms a habit of the ice cube becomes a little bit of a treat for these guys. The reason I use ice cubes is because it's a little bit soothing to that, to that puppy. It's not going to be confused with anything else. That's maybe the biggest reason. They're not going to confuse an ice cube with my shoes. They're not going to confuse an ice cube with a training dummy. They're not going to confuse an ice cube with an antler. They're not going to confuse an ice cube with anything I want them to pick up and bring back to me in the future. So that leads me to the next point. What do we want our retrieving dogs to do? Pick things up and bring them back to us. Habit forming. Remember, we're always forming habits. Good and bad form at the same pace. Sometimes bad, I think, forms quicker. So keep all this in mind. What do we want our retrievers to do? Pick stuff up, bring it back to me. What do we do? How do we get them to do that? Well, first off, I think most of the time it's a relatively natural thing that they do. That's why you bought them, retrievers, because their last name is Retrieve. They bring stuff back to you. That's what they do. We polish it up. We make it nicer. We, make, we eliminate some of the potentially bad habits that can form up to fit our needs. If the dog gets it back to us, that's that's a win. If it gets it back to us without putzing around, that's even better. If it gets back to us without running off, that's even better. So for our purposes, for what we're going to do with them, we refine it and polish it up to fit our needs as hunters. So pick it up, bring it back. Picking it up and bringing it back is usually pretty, pretty natural. It's the stuff in between that we finalize. Now, the idea of this is dog gets a tra- dog gets a, an antler to chew on or a squeaky toy to chew on, or a rope to chew on, or a whatever, name it whatever it is you want to give them. I've seen, this is terrible, I've been in the aisles of Petco's and Pet Smarts, and I've seen rawhide pieces that look like shoes. They look like a shoe, it's made out of rawhide, it's cute, and you give it to your dog. And then you get pissed when they chew up mom's pumps. You trained the dog to chew on something that looks like a a shoe, and then you get mad when they chew on a shoe. It doesn't make any sense. So we're not going to give them things that look like antlers, feel like antlers, are antlers, when our goal is for a shed dog to pick up an antler and bring it back to me. Because what they're going to do is they're going to lay down and chew on it. And the other thing that you got to keep in mind is repetition is habits are formed by repetition and consistency. So the more often you do something, the more strongly the habit forms. So when you've got that little puppy and you've got those antlers laying around the house or the yard or the kennel or the crate or wherever you're keeping them and they chew on them for 10 minutes out of a 24 hour day, there's a habit that's formed for 10 minutes. They chew on it. That's not what I want my shed dog to do. All right. So let's get that out of the way. What do they do the other 23 hours and 50 minutes of the day? Ignore, walk by, not pick up, not chew, not do anything with the antler. What habit forms stronger if you do something for 23 hours or you do something for 10 minutes? What habit is going to form the strongest? The one that you do the most. So the last thing I want 
is to A, form a negative or undesirable habit, and B, I, wanna, I don't wanna form the idea of a dog ignoring, leaving alone, walking past, getting bored with, having seen no value in a certain object. Now, certain things I don't want the dogs chewing on. So I don't mind if they walk past them all day long and don't chew on them, as long as they don't chew on them. My shoes, as my dogs get older, I'm looking over right now in the corner and Ben's moccasin, it's moccasin season around here, guys. We were Crocs all summer long. Ben informed me very quickly, you can't wear Crocs in this weather, he said. I said, why not? He said, because there's holes and the snow will get into them. So he breaks out his true, I don't know what brand they are, but they are, uh, huh? Redhead. They are redhead moccasins. Yeah, and, Cabela's. And I am telling you right now, it's like Pocahontas walks into the shop every <laughs> single day. But he's got these little moccasins on, and, and I'm telling you, he gets pretty spiffed up for, for work. Today we're having a Christmas party, and Ben wore his sweatpants. <laughs> so he brought, wore his nice sweatpants. So. And, my flannel. and his flannel. And his nice <laughs> flannel. But I think that's the same flannel you had on yesterday. It's my jacket. Oh, it's a jacket, but he wears it as a shirt. So we, whatever. You know, I'm not here to judge you anybody. You wear your red flannel every day. No. Yeah. That's a jacket. That's, That's what this is, too? But What's the I don't wear it like a shirt. You're wearing it like a shirt every day, all day. I'm so cold-blooded. Anyway. It's cold, though. And we're saving on energy, so we're, we turn the heat down a little bit during the day. But that's beside the point. But anyway, moccasins are laying by my door, and I got three adult dogs that have walked past them as we came in and left them alone. I've got three adult dogs right now that are laying on their beds. Bella is not an adult dog. And Bella likes to pick stuff up. And Pe Bella, we called the crocodile hunter because she would, used to pick up crocs like crazy and pick them up and retrieve them to me. I did not correct her for it when she was younger. Just in the last three to four weeks, I've given her a firm, ah, 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 leave it, when she goes to pick one of them up. It's the first time I've ever turned her off of the idea of picking something up. And it's because it's time. She's, she, I know her retrieve is strong enough. I'm, yesterday, this brings us full circle back to the training dummy. Yesterday we made the first retrieves with her, with the training dummy. And what happened, Ben, the first time I set her up as a trailing memory for it, I sent her, she ran out to it, and she didn't pick it up. And she kept hunting, she kept hunting, she kept hunting. She's in the snow, she saw the dummy. She kept hunting, she kept hunting, she kept hunting. The reason is, is because I set that drill up the same way I've set drills up now for months. And every time she's picked anything up, it's been a training dummy or a tennis ball. And when I say a training dummy, not an antler, like a, like a bird dummy. Some have had wings, some, have had, some haven't had them. Our, our fire hose bumpers that we sell, we've got five sizes of them. She's picked up every size. And every time we went to a new size when she was a puppy, she'd struggle to pick it up because part of it was she wasn't sure if that was something she should pick up or not. And this time with the training dummy, which is an antler shape, and the training dummy is not gonna poke her. It's not gonna jab her. So there's no reason to all of a sudden cut tines off or grind tines down. It's let that look like an antler. If you cut all the tines off an antler, it looks like a stick. It doesn't look like an antler anymore. So the training dummy is what I use to introduce the idea of what it looks like without that risk of them poking, jabbing, or hurting themselves. It's not gonna feel like a hard antler in her mouth. It feels like a training dummy because it's made out of a similar material. So we, but we did that yesterday and she ran past it and wouldn't pick it up. So I said, okay, let's go over, called her back. I picked up the antler and I went, okay, I gotta take steps back in the training because me setting it up as a trailing memory was too far down the road. It wasn't A, it was somewhere around F and I'm trying to get to Z. So I use this, this idea of A, B, C, D, eventually you get to Z. Don't go from A to Z. So I tried starting out in the middle of the alphabet and my dog didn't do it. Imagine that. So what do I do? Don't panic, don't freak out, don't get upset. I could have been, I know people who have been mad at their dog and embarrassed at the idea that they won't pick it up. Oh, they're not gonna be a shed dog because they didn't pick up the training dummy the first time. Literally, people feel that way. I didn't care. I went, oh man, I went too fast. Take a step back. I didn't start out with trailing memories with training dummies or tennis balls with the dog. I started out with it, I teased the puppy a little bit and I rolled it out and I let it chase down, pick it up. I, no steadiness, no formalities, just be predator and this is prey. Chase it down, pick it up, bring it back. That She already brings stuff back. Predator prey is in her. So I pitched, I teased her, I kind of got her excited about the training dummy. I pitched it, she ran down and 
started to try picking it up. And as soon as she started to pick it up, I went, you're a good girl. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And she picked it up and brought it back to me. And we did that two or three times. And then I, had her be, then I asked her to be steady. I pitched it down, I made her stay. Then I sent her. Then I set up a trailing memory. So within five minutes, I had her doing the trailing memory, but it took six or seven steps, baby little incremental things to get her to do it. it worked out really well. We filmed it. So it's, it's gonna be a Bella Be Goods video. I mean, it's a couple weeks out yet, probably. Um, but then, before we'll post it, and it's also going to be part of the North American Whitetail segment that we just filmed. So, but I'm and I'm sharing it here. So we're one of the things that we're trying to become more efficient with is how do we use this basic training stuff and spread it out in different ways for people to be a, hopefully helpful. So you're getting a audio version of verbal video. So we did that. And we got her to pick up that training dummy. Today we're gonna to do the same thing. It's just a simple way for me to form a habit that is desirable. But I won't let her play with that dummy. And, and I won't let her walk past Ben's moccasins without having the understanding of she's probably gonna reach out and wanna pick them up. So when we went past them today, I had her on a leash. And she didn't really even pay attention to him, which was great. And that's because over the last couple of weeks, I've started to tell her, no, leave it. I've taught her that certain things do not equal retrieve, but certain things do. And so as we add things to the list of what does, we're going to continue to add things to the list of what doesn't, but we're careful before we start telling them what doesn't get retrieved, we waited a while and we were patient and we let the dog make retrieves of sandals, socks, mocks, crocs, you say it, whatever it is. We let the dog pick those up early on. Now it's time to change that. So this idea of grinding the points down, letting them have it as a toy in his kennel, and your friend says that that will help when he sees a shed in the woods, he'll pick it up and think it's a toy. He might, but he's probably going to respond to it the same way you've trained him, which is what we expect of these dogs. Uh, what our goal is is to have the dogs respond to our training. And if you train into the dog, <clears throat> there's something that you can lay down and chew on, or there's something that you can lay down and chew on a little bit sometimes the rest of the time just forget about it ignore it walk by it that's the results you're going to get and they don't process and think about things the way we do they just understand what we teach them and so that's where that's where it's the great part one of the great parts about working with a dog here it is they'll do what we ask them to do if we ask them to do it in a way that they'll understand and so they don't understand and they don't learn the way we do. So we have to adjust our teaching to fit the way that they learn. And I think that can be said, like that's what a good teacher does. Whether it's dog training, whether it's teaching kids, whether it's coaching a basketball team, and, and the, flex, the understanding and the willingness of that teacher or coach or trainer, the willingness and understanding of that, the amount that they understand and the willingness that they're, able to, to, to make those adjustments, that I think dictates a lot of their success. Or it limits them to how much success they'll find. Because if you match up the exact right student, the exact right dog, the exact right player with the exact right elements and the exact right coach and the exact right scenarios, everything lines up perfectly, it'll work. But how often does that happen? It just doesn't happen very often. So. The parts that need to be adjusted, the parts that need to be tweaked, are the parts that you control. And so I can't change my dog's genetics. I guess I could buy different genetics, which I do. I do try to find the dogs that fit me best. In fact, I'm trying to build the dog that fits me best. And I'm doing that with the help of what I think are some of the best resources in the country. I'm working with different kennels and, and buying certain genetics and certain lines and studying as much as I can. And then I mix and match until I figure out what I think is the perfect dog for me. That doesn't mean it's the perfect dog for you or the next guy or the next girl. But for me, it does. That's, what I'm, that's my goal. So I'm trying to even control that part of it. But one thing that you and I can 100% control is how much, how we put, control our inputs into this equation. And that's, that's our training. So I thought that was a really good question from Jesse. Um, it, you guys got a little bit of 
little bit more than just one topic in that podcast. Um, I do think that as shed season approaches, we're going to be talking a little bit more about it. And it's also going to kind of piggyback with some of our Bella stuff because we've done Bella updates throughout this podcast process. Um, we've probably done Bella updates a handful of times, four or five times at least. Um, it's probably not a bad idea to do one uh, specifically, but um, we'll see how that goes. But shed, shed training right now is going to take a little bit of a, um, the spotlight because it's the time of the year. And, and it's not the time of year to go shed hunting, I don't think. It depends on where you live, I guess, but not where I live. Um, it's going to be a few months. So right now, I look at it and I go, as we wrap up tracking, now we did some tracking with Bella. Bella did, got, her, got on her first track this last week too, which was awesome. We recorded it. We're going to be able to share a lot of that. Um, but that that's kind of winding down. Now, we missed a pretty... We, uh, we're going to still shoot some... We're going to end up shooting probably some deer late season yet, um, which we will... will have her to have some opportunities. We'll have more opportunities to do training with her than we will the real thing, but we're gonna try to take advantage of the real thing uh, in the waning moments here of our season. Um, some of you guys that are listening uh, probably have later seasons than us, so you might be able to as well. But the timing of her age and where we're at and how it fit into our training, we're doing the best we can to fit what we can in prior to the season. Shed season is coming. And we're going to have a really nice opportunity to do some shed hunting. And we're not going to be bird hunting for another year. Well, not, not a year now, but it'll be nine months before we're bird hunting. It'll be nine months before we're tracking again after the next probably month. We probably have a month left. Then we're going to be about a nine-month wait, eight-month wait until we have a chance to do that. But sheds are going to be just around the corner. So we're going to shift our, our processes to incorporate and build in the value of the antler, the scent of the antler, um, because that's that's our next opportunity. And so as a dog that I consider to be relatively versatile, um, the foundation will be there and continue to be built. Now we're going to branch off of that foundation and start dialing in a little bit more on the, on the formalities of the field, uh, some more specifics, some more niche training that's really going to lend itself to specific skills that we're going to build into these dogs which we're going to use during specific seasons because ultimately we have we have aspirations and goals of hunting but we also realize what needs to be there first and we also realize without without that we don't enjoy the dog the majority of the time and to me the best hunting dog in the world i am not interested in if i can't enjoy the dog like i am right now with four dogs laying around us quiet as can be in the studio, our kitchen. So that's it for today. I think that was a, a great question from Jesse, Jesse Welsh. Jesse, you're gonna get an email from me, or uh, I'll message you um, and get your address because you're gonna get a t-shirt because uh, we are going to start giving back to those who give to us and those who provide us with great questions. Um, if we use your question on a podcast, we're going to give you a T-shirt. I just think it's uh, it's the least we can do uh, to show some support back for the support you've given us. Um, so, Jesse, I'll be sending you a message. After From that, um, we're going to record a couple more here. So these come out pretty quickly after we record them. Ben turns them around pretty quickly. They're usually posted within a few days. Um, so we're gonna, we, we've got a window here. We're going to crank a few out, and you'll, you'll see some... Uh, You'll see some, if you're not a subscriber, you should, I think. Wherever you're, wherever you're listening to this, you should subscribe. If you're listening through our website, I don't think you can subscribe through the website. Mm -hmm. But you can, you'll, you'll probably see, you'll see me post some, some uh, promo videos and uh, I kind of announce it when we, when we have another one go live via Facebook and Instagram. But if you are on a podcast app, my recommendation would be to subscribe to it because I think, and you can turn your notifications on because then you'll get notifications when new ones are available. Um, and also, if you would do us the favor of leaving reviews, that, that I've had so many people respond to that request of mine, and I thank you for that. I'm going to continue to ask you to, to do that. Um, it helps us understand a little bit better of how we're doing as far as getting things out there. It also helps, I think it helps with the idea of it getting out to other people as recommended as, as um, it's kind of organic growth that way. So you guys know us by now. We don't have a marketing budget to do it any other way. So 
uh, organically and through your shares and through your posts and through your recommendations to friends and family. That's how we continue to grow and we appreciate it. So thank you again. Number 50, man. We turned a half century. Ah, feels good, doesn't it? Yep. Okay. We're done. 